here at the end of the discussion, but I need you to fill out a form at the end of the round. Is this okay? All right, well, thank you so much for coming today. Um, we're going to talk about initial triage, what to do after something has happened. There's been some type of a compromise on your network, and you need to make a determination relatively quickly as to whether or not this is something that is sinister and potentially requires a, a formal incident response, or if this is just garbage noise and you can just move on. Uh, and we're going to talk about a couple of free tools that you can use in order to facilitate that and to be able to quickly drill into that intrusion and find out um, the, the information about whether or not this is an advanced attacker who is active on your network or if this is, again, just garbage crap that you can just flatten the box and, and move on. <coughs> So uh, just a little background about me. I've been in this field for quite a long time. Um, I actually got my first job in the computer industry 30 years ago, which just pains me to actually say 30 years. But um, uh, that, that picture there, believe it or not, is actually the system that I was trained on first out of college. It's a H500. If you know what that is, then kudos. You, you're just as old as I am. Um, I, I got into IT security in the 90s. I was working as a system administrator for a company that's no longer around, Telzon. It, again, if you've ever heard of them, kudos. Um, and I was like the Unix guy. And, and all of the things that we had connected to the internet were all something that I was responsible for. And so, you know, you read, I was reading about these hackers and the things that people are doing. And it, it worried me that one of my systems might get compromised. And then that would reflect badly on me. So I, I wanted to find out how did people do what they do? You know, how are these people getting into these systems? What tools are they using? You know, what, what, what uh, methods are they using to get in? And, and I found that I really liked it. I found that it was really interesting. And so that's something that uh, in, in 2005, I was actually at the time working for Sun Microsystems. And they did me one of the biggest favors that they could have ever done. They, they, terminated me. They, <laughs> I got riffed. Um, and in, in many ways, if, if you've ever gotten that phone call, your chest gets tight, you're like, oh my God, what do I do now? But like I said, in many ways, it was actually the best possible thing because uh, I, I was able then to reshift my career. And since 2005, I've been focused on security. Uh, I do work for Mandiant slash FireEye. So, you know, full disclosure, I am a vendor. I guess, one of the bad guys. But uh, this is not a sales presentation. I'm not here to sell you anything. We're just going to talk about some free tools that are out there and some techniques that you can use for that initial triage of a situation. So this is a, a quick rundown of what we're going to be talking about. Um, what is an APT? Why is that different? You know, APTs versus garbage malware. Why should I worry about that? We're going to walk through a typical scenario, and then we'll actually walk through, and I'll show you the tools in action. I'll show you how these tools can be utilized on your network and in your environment, uh, and what some of the simple things that you can do with them in order to be able to drill in and determine what the impact of that intrusion is. Uh, and then again, to then make a determination as to whether or not you should do a full formal incident response. Um, and I do, I do recommend for most shops, especially enterprise shops, uh, incident response is something that is really, really detailed. And I strongly recommend, regardless of, of who it is that you employ, there's several uh, folks out there, Mandian, of course, is one of them, but there are several organizations that, that do a first-class job in terms of incident response. And if you do make that determination that this is something that's more than just typical garbage, um, I strongly recommend that you call in the cavalry on something like that and you bring in professionals whose job, the people who are really focused on incident response. And what we're going to be talking again today about is really that sort of initial triage. So, you know, just a little baseline about uh, APT versus garbage malware. 
So, you know, when you say APT, you can almost hear the people's eyes rolling in the room. Um, in, in this industry, we tend to latch on to things and, you know, <laughs> say APT again. I dare you, right? So is it, we, we latch on to these things and, and as vendors, I, I'm just as guilty as anybody else. Uh, but, but there is a good reason for this one. And, and it is descriptive, and it's important to understand what it is that we're talking about. I think a lot of people who toss that term around have no idea what they're talking about, or they think they've, they've heard something about it, and they know it's something impactful. Uh, and, and what we're talking about, when I talk about an advanced threat or an APT, this is the Wikipedia definition. And you notice it says that, that I'll, I'll focus on the, the, the last part of that. I'm not going to read the whole slide for you, but often orchestrated by humans targeting a specific entity. And I would say that from a Mandiant standpoint and from the, the viewpoint that I have of that, it's always a human. And that's, that is the key differentiator there. It, it, it is a human being who is, who is reaching into your network. Um, and it is a targeted attack. And the reason that targeted attacks are different, again, it's, this is not just bits of code. So uh, there there have been pieces of malware throughout computing history that you know, they, they've done a lot of damage. Um, you know, they, they, they continue to. Ransomware is a good example. And I've got, you know, something we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But uh, the point I'm making is that with the targeted attack, this is an individual. This is This is a group of individuals. They have an objective. Their objective is to get into your network the, their objective is to burrow themselves in and to be as quiet and stealthy as possible while they're doing that and gather their, the, the, the data in order to uh, achieve their objective, get it out of your perimeter, and, and if at all possible, maintain that persistence so that they can come back in. Um, they are very well funded. They are uh, professional. These are people that do this for a living. Uh, nation states are involved in this, and we're going to talk about one of those in just a moment. Uh, but you know, the, the fact of the matter is that uh, uh, that, that, that it's, it's something that most organizations, if, they, if it's not on your radar now, it really should be. So probably one of the biggest differentiators between what I would consider an APT or a targeted attack and just average run-of-the-mill garbage malware is the noisy versus silent. The, you, when, when you're dealing with something that has a lot of pop-ups, there's a couple of examples there with uh, some of the ransomware that's out there. If it's something where it's obvious and there's pop-ups and things are, are changing the toolbars on your browser and they're downloading things to the desktop, then that's generally not going to be a targeted attack. If, it, if it's associated with a targeted attack, it, it's strictly as a diversionary tactic. The, the, the APTs that, that we deal with and the targeted threat actors that we deal with, uh, they want to stay below the radar. They want to be very, very quiet and stealthy. Um, you know, <laughs> a, a line up there, APTs are silent but deadly, but that's very, very true. Um, one thing to bear in mind and that I think is surprising, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised by it, quite honestly, in dealing with customers on this issue, is you have to have a plan. There are a lot of organizations who, quite frankly, are making up that plan as they go along. They're flying by the seat of their pants. They find themselves in the middle of an incident, and uh, you know that's, it's a little bit late at that point. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a trite expression, but if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And and so it's very important to have a plan for what to do in incident response. Uh, it's very important to do things like wargaming, though, that plan. I went to a very interesting ISC Squared meeting a couple of months ago, and that was what they did. They, they actually took this, there's this room full of people, it's about the same amount of people as in this room. Um, we, were, we were separated into different teams, and then we were given scenarios of incidents. What do you do now? What is the next thing you do? Uh, and it was frightening. You know, surprising and amusing, quite honestly, that this room full of security professionals really, in many cases, didn't know what to do next. Okay, we know we have this alert, but what do we do now? Uh, and, and so that's something that, that definitely want to make sure that uh, you think about ahead of time. 
Uh, part of that is baselining. Uh, some of the tools that, that one in particular that we're going to be talking about, it gives you the capability to be able to establish a baseline. Um, yes, there's a question in the back. NIST has some good stuff, um, and you know that's a good place to start. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the question was: Is there a practical, a good practical example online uh, for incident response? I don't know if the people in the back heard that. Society General has all of their incident response stuff online, and, and you can Google it. Thank you. It's a, another good good resource. So the important thing to do, you know, when, when an alert fires, if there is some reason to suspect that this is more than the typical alert, it you should do at least some cursory investigation before re-imaging. Uh, and this is something that, quite honestly, uh, I have seen happen in several customer environments where they'll, they'll get an alert on their IPS, they'll get some type of uh, indicator telling them that something happened on this system, they go out there, they just re-image it, and they move on. And what ends up happening all too often is by the time they actually get to that system and they get to a point where they've re-imaged that system, that threat actor has burrowed themselves somewhere into their network and it's too late because it's not about malware after the initial intrusion. That's the other, I think that's the other mistake that we as an industry, we kind of focus on the malware part of that. But it's important to understand that the malware is really just the brick that they're, bro they're thrown through the window to get in. It's just the, you know, the crowbar they're, they're getting the door open with. It's what they do once they get inside that's potentially impactful. And, you know, there have been uh, a couple of talks here this weekend about using PowerShell and how, uh, you know, how, how powerful that can be. And, of course, has been pointed out, it's not, not going to trick trip any AV because it's not malware. It's going to work just fine with whitelisting because it's whitelisted. Uh, and once they get in and they have those credentials and they can move around, uh, you know, that's where the real damage comes from. And, and again, the P stands for persistent, right? So we're talking about organizations and um, uh, individuals who are very, very persistent. So uh, these are just some screenshots of some typical garbage stuff that you see, um, you know, fake alert, um, fake AV was really the bane of, of antivirus for a long time, and it really still is. Um, you know, some of these ones with uh, the, the, the ransomware can be particularly damaging. And I, I don't want to, I, I guess I don't want to make light of some of the garbage stuff that's out there. It can really be damaging. It can cause a lot of damage. And that damage, uh, you know, in, in terms of lost man hours, in terms of time, in some cases in terms of the files that get destroyed, uh, th there's a real cost associated with that, and so I don't want to minimize it, uh, but having said that, it, it, it really pales in, con in comparison to what some of the threat actors are doing in terms of stealing intellectual property. You know, we have, uh, we've had, so I've talked with a few customers where, you know, they, they literally are almost run out of business because uh, you know, they were they were wide open, uh, and and they just didn't anticipate that threat actors were going to steal their intellectual property with such, you know, fer ferociousness. So this is this is the uh, um, the kill chain. So I, if you if you're familiar with it, I think probably a lot of people in the room have seen this before. But this really describes the the different phases of the attack, and and how an advanced threat actor uh, what they utilize to get in. So the initial compromise again, that's typically some type of malware. It's typically a phishing attack. So the the last M Trends report, if you read the M Trends report or similar report, Verizon has a good uh, data breach report as well. The, that they put out every year, and it is shockingly effective. The, it, it, there's, there's been a big push in corporate America, uh, particularly to educate people about phishing attacks. If you see that link, don't click on that link. You know, th that whole investigation, uh, telling people how to, uh, to, to verify that this is or is not a legitimate email, uh, and yet there's still a percentage of the user population that no matter what CBT you have them go through, no matter what kind of training you give, 
um, they're still going to click that link. The, the, there's just a percentage that's going to do that. And unfortunately, some of the people with the highest level access in corporations tend to be those same people. Um, you know, so especially it's, it becomes very difficult sometimes to have those conversations with people that title begins with a C. Uh, and, and unfortunately, if someone who has access to that level of information gets compromised, it can be a very damaging a very damaging attack. So establish foothold, escalate privileges. We usually see things like credential harvesters and credential stealers in this. Uh, do some type of internal recon to be able to find other uh, uh, targets of interest within the organization. Move laterally and of course exfiltrate data. And the question that, that often comes up in this, uh, in this type of a discussion is why should I worry about it? You know, this is not something, uh, I'm not a DOD contractor. Uh, you know, I don't work for, uh, uh, I, I don't want to use the name of a particular bank. I don't work for XYZ Financial Corporation. So this is not something that is particularly worrisome for me. Um, I, I, I'm going to call out China on this one just from the standpoint that quite honestly, they do tend to be uh, very active in this regard. Now, China's response to that would be that we, the U.S., are just as active. And I think that Edward Snowden's revelations, probably, there's probably a lot of truth to that. Uh, you know, we probably are just as active. I'm not going to get into the politics of it, uh, but just to say that they have actually been very nice about telling us what it is that they're going to focus on. They have a five-year plan. Uh, and that five-year plan lists out what are their priorities for the next five years. We're at the tail end of the 12th five-year plan. There's a new one that will be coming into it to, to focus on in 2015. But if you're on this list, if you're associated with an organization that either does business uh, or is a support or a partnership with, with companies that are on this, this list, then chances are really, really good that there are individuals who have you as an objective and just as you guys come into work every day and you have a priority list, a to-do list, like I have a to-do list of things that I need to accomplish, their to-do list is to steal your data and, and to get into your, into your systems. And, and, you know, that's just, that's just how it is. And well, the, the interesting thing about it is um, they don't just take, like, the blueprints. So I, I think when I first became aware of this, I was really surprised at, at just how voracious they are in terms of stealing data. So they won't just take the plans for the super secret helicopter blade or whatever it is. They want the, the plans for the plant that manufactures it. They want the HR records for the people who work in that plant. Uh, they want the overtime records to find out what kind of effort there is involved in it. They want the invoices for all the raw materials and who they're talking with and what they're paying and what their quotes and their margins are. I mean, it's, it's just really mind-boggling. So here's a typical scenario we're going to walk through. And then we'll, uh, uh, I'll, I'll roll over to more of a demo and we'll walk through and I'll show you some of these tools and how these tools can be used in this situation. So we've got our hapless user who has called the help desk. Hello, help desk. And here's the help desk. Yes, how can I help you? Um, well, my computer's acting funny. And it all started right after I clicked the link my friend sent me. So I've got this, uh, I've got this email and I know this person, they've sent me email before, uh, we're always exchanging information, so uh, she clicked the link, and it's for this game, the Rain Rainbow Unicorn game, and of course, Rainbow Unicorns, right? Who doesn't love Rainbow Unicorns? And so all you have to do is click that link, and it starts up this fabulous game, and in reality, that Rainbow Unicorn ends up vomiting all over her system. So what are the tools <laughs> what are the tools we're going to use to, to, to look at this this particular compromise? The first one is a free tool from Mandy and it's called Redline. And what Redline does is it gives you the ability to rapidly triage hosts. There's a deep, you know, there's a there's a, a guided analysis, and I'll show you that when we go through you know the actual demo. Uh, 
some of the cool things about it is that it, it gives you this risk index based on these different risk factors. Uh, if you have something in particular that you found that you know to be problematic, that you've identified as being, let's say, zero-day malware or a toolkit or certain indicators of that compromise, and, and it doesn't have to be a file or an MD5. It could be a registry location. It could be the presence of a, of a directory. It, 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 there's, there's a long list, and I'll show you what some of that looks like as well. It's not on my list, but there's a, a sister um, application called IOC Editor. And what IOC Editor does is it gives you the ability to build some very complex indicators of compromise. And then using Redline, you can then search for those indicators of compromise. Uh, and determine whether or not systems have been affected by that. Uh, Process Explorer, yes, there's a question in the back. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Well, I mean, it depends. And it's, it's, the question was, how long does it take Redline to go through a, a 320 gig drive? I mean, it depends. And we'll, when we, when I actually call up the screen and we build a collector, uh, we can talk about that. But yes, depending upon what it is that you're going to collect, it can take a long time. Uh, there are some ways to, to shorten that cycle. And the IOC, co IOC collector is a good way to do that. If you have an idea of what it is that you're looking for, or something that is of particular importance, an IOC collector will literally just collect just that. So instead of collecting, you know, the the entire memory image and and going through the whole process, it will actually just collect what you need for that one identification. Um, Process Explorer is a, another great tool. It's a free tool from Microsoft, uh, and it gives you a quick view of what's running on a system. And it has some interesting capabilities in terms of being able to verify the digital signature and also be able to verify whether or not that there's an entry on virus total for that particular binary. Um, it is just the hash. Great question, yes. The question was, is it just the hash? There's, there is a, an option, and I'll show you that when we, when we actually get to that screen. I strongly recommend not using this option where it will actually take anything that's not recognized and shoot it up to virus total. And I know for years and years, um, you know, I worked for a couple of antivirus vendors that seemed to be pretty much the standard thing that we would do if, if uh, there was some type of malware that got past one of our scanners, we'd send it up to virus total. Well, it turns out when you're dealing with advanced threat actors, that's exactly the wrong thing to do because they, they know what the hash of that system that, that file is that they created. Chances are really good that file was created, targeted just for you or just your organization. And so they know that this is the unicorn file, for instance. And if they see an update on that hash, that tells them that their, their prey has now gotten wise to what they're doing. They're, they're, you're basically tipping your hand to the adversary, telling them, you know, well, you know that they're in, their, in your network and, and it's time for them to change up and change ta tactics. And that's exactly what they do. Um, I should have mentioned in the other screen another strength of, um, of Redline and also of Process Explorer and, and, and PE uh, Studio, which we're going to talk about in a second. All of them are portable, so they can run from a USB. And then PE Studio, I, I wish I could pronounce the gentleman's name who wrote this. It's a fantastic tool. Um, it's a free tool. And what it does is it gives you the ability to very quickly perform a static analysis of a Windows binary. And it's drag and drop. It is literally that easy to be able to just drag that binary into the tool. And there are a number of pre-built indicators that will tell you whether or not this is something that's problematic. Um, and it can be customizable. I haven't actually gotten into doing any customizing on it, uh, you know, just from the standpoint that it's pretty comprehensive out of the box. Uh, but for those folks who do like to get their, their hands under the hood, who like to get their, their, their hands dirty, um, you certainly can do that, um, and that is definitely an option. So a couple of things to think about, you know, when we set up um, and, and how to prepare and what to think about when you're going to go into performing one of these investigations. Again, be careful about how you, how you react. Um, you, you don't want to tip off the adversary that you know that they're there. 
Uh, you know, I have actually seen incident responses for large corporations where it was known that certain systems were compromised and they, they actually left that system compromised with the threat actor uh, active on those systems so that they could observe what that threat actor was doing. Uh, I don't recommend doing that as a matter of best practice, okay? That was something where there were, there were people engaged and uh, there were a lot of folks who made the determination to do that. Uh, but, but again, the, the, the point that of what we're going to be talking about here in just a moment when we're walking through this triage is really just to make a determination as a frontline person, is this something that's just garbage nonsense and we could just you know, re-image and move on? Or is this something more sinister that's going to require a deeper dive investigation? Uh, and, and I want to point out that there are some very uh, important artifacts on the system that will be lost if it's powered down or, or rebooted. So if you have a situation where somebody is geographically remote, for instance, and this happens a lot where someone will be working from a satellite office and the, they'll say, well, we've got these problems. Okay, go ahead and shut your laptop down and send it to me. Well. You know, a lot of that, a lot of those artifacts that potentially could have been used in order to identify what's what's happening and the impact of that intrusion are going to be lost the second it loses power, the second it gets powered down. So, at a minimum, think about things that that you would want to gather from the system prior to that power down, so that when that laptop arrives at your facility and you take it out of the box, you at least already have some of this other information that you can look at very quickly to determine whether or not, um, you know, again, this is uh, what type of a compromise this is. You could, yeah. The, the, the question was, could, how about hibernating it? Yeah, that, that's an option. I, that, that was one example that I used because I, I, I actually that was at a customer site when they, when they did that. They pulled the laptop out, but it was already, it was already shut down. So. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure there are tools that can work with that. You know, the, the tools that, that we're going to be talking about really are kind of more focused on a live system that, that, that's, that's, that's executing. But uh, sure, I'm sure there are tools that, that, can, that can use that. I was just referring to the process. I wasn't sure how that process works with Yeah, I think the only real um, um, fear there would be that, that the battery would run out or something happens in shipment and, and then, you know, that gets lost. But, uh, but it's, it's definitely a possibility. So um, unless there's any other questions, I'm going to go ahead and roll over into my VMware environment and we can, I can show you what these look like in action. Let me go ahead and make that a little bit larger. So this is this is Redline. Um, when you first start up Redline, it actually gives you the capability to whether or not you want to start a you know create a collector. I have it already pre-opened to the Redline package that we're going to be looking at just uh, for brevity and just to, to, to make it easier. Um, but notice that there are a number of collectors that we can create: a standard collector, a comprehensive. An IOC collector. Uh, the the only real difference between a standard and a comprehensive is the the, the default options that get selected out of the box. Uh, so you know a standard collector is really intended to be just for the minimum that you would need in order to perform some quick uh, triage of the system. Comprehensive is a little bit more. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and create a collector here and show you what the process looks like. So it start it pops up a window here with uh, the the collector. Uh, and we have the ability to edit the script. And what it does is it actually creates uh, a, a, a batch file. Uh, and it bundles that batch file with different parameters uh, and, and demanding an agent. It's actually the same agent that we, well, it's, it's a, a, an offshoot, a version of the agent that we have in our, in, in our enterprise um, products. But uh, it, it uses that, that same agent 
in order to interrogate the system. And the reason for that is because it can execute at, at the kernel level uh, and there are certain things that we can do that are kind of interesting in terms of being able to pull information off the disk or, or read from memory. Um, so this gives us, you know, this is our script. Uh, we can see that there are different things here that, uh, you know, in terms of process listing. Uh, strings is really an interesting thing to, to grab from processes, and I'll show you some examples of why that is in just a minute. Um, the, the, anytime you add strings or any of the hashing to the point that was raised in the back uh, earlier, it is definitely going to slow it down a little bit. Uh, in terms of the strings on the running processes, it's not really going to run it, it, slow it down that much. Uh, but when you start getting into like the disk, if you uh, it, when you're doing enumerating the file system, if you're enumerating the entire file system and grabbing you know a copy of the master file system table, and then also uh, doing things like uh, including deleted files uh, and, and, and doing strings and hashing of those files, then that can that can be very intensive and it could take a long time to run. Um, you know, some of the other things that uh, uh, can take a lot of time. Uh, apologize, where's it at? Here, the event logs. So you can actually pull over a copy of the event logs so that you can review that in the Redline package. Um, but if that system has been running for a long time, or if this is a server that's very, you know, in, in a very busy environment, um, that can absolutely take a long time to chug through. So. Uh, you know what I had recommended earlier on. Uh, I, I, that same recommendation, same recommendation holds true. Uh, do some baselining. You know this is the red line is the kind of the, the, it, you can think of it as a Swiss Army knife. There's a lot of things that it can do, and uh, it's a really cool and powerful tool. Uh, it can be a little bit intimidating at first, and and I'll show you some easy, quick pivots and drills in just a second that make it a little bit easier. You know to 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 work with, but. Uh, I strongly recommend, again, getting a baseline of your systems. That'll help out because there's a lot of things, and, and I'll show you some examples of this in a sec, uh, there's a lot of things that are sort of borderline with Redline, um, and, and you could, they're potentially false positives. And, and if you don't know what it is that you're looking at, if you don't, don't have a baseline to compare it against, uh, then you can find yourself going down some wild goose chases. So we can, I, I just want to point out, we can grab, you know, we can enumerate the file system um, in terms of the system. We can grant, you know, analyze restore points. We can uh, do registry hive enumeration. We can grab the registry, um, analyze prefetch. Prefetch has some really interesting things in it, and I'll show you that in a minute. In terms of network, uh, we want to get, you know, the port enumeration. Uh, browser history, all of the cookies, the, the, the form history, file downloads, URL history, uh, the ARP tables, services, get, get the running services, be able to verify digital signatures, uh, common persistence mechanisms. So basically, uh, have an idea based on your baseline of what it is that you're looking for. If you're not sure, then just basically go ahead and select everything. Uh, it's better to have more than, than less, but beware that, that it could take quite a long time for it to chug through. Uh, we can also acquire a memory image, and there are some cool things we can do with that. Uh, you know, we can actually pull processes out of memory. We can pull executables out of memory, and I have an example of, of where we've done that. To be perfectly honest, there's some other tools that are out there, like volatility, that probably are, are you know, arguably better at, uh, uh, at, at memory analysis. I think one of the biggest strengths that Redline has is that it ties together a lot of different types of data into a single relatively easy to follow GUI uh, so that you can start your investigation. But it's really not intended to be the end-all be-all for all tools. This isn't, you know, the one ring to rule them all. Uh, and, and, and I think if there's one thing that I've learned in, in digging into this subject is that uh, really it's a conglomeration of a lot of different viewpoints collected from a lot of different tools that lead you to your conclusion. So, you know, a, a lot of it is really what's going to be right for you. I'm sorry? I don't. I, I, that's a good question. The question was, will volatility read a red line image?
I have not. I, that's something that I'm I'm going to I'll probably work on for next year's talk. So, so um, when you first open Redline to uh, uh, when you open the package, it, there's a lot of information in here. Um, this tells you a little bit about the system. You know what the system is, what type of system it is. Uh, and then notice that there are a number of different guide points here of where to get started. So uh, if I know, for instance, you know, it probably doesn't, uh, this probably doesn't count in most places, uh, but if I know if I have an external lead, and in this case, uh, the, the scenario that we're going to be walking through that external lead is a situation where the person has called, they found something wrong with uh, their system after they did something, and so we're going to start there. But it could also be, uh, an IPS alert, it could be something on your firewall, it could be something that you hear about from an external source. Actually, last year's mTrends report, uh, we actually uh, reported that somewhere around 67, I think, percent of entities found out about intrusions from an external source. So that means someone with a badge, for instance, showing up and telling you that this is a problem, or somebody from another organization who has detected uh, attacks coming from your, from your um, network. So this tells you, this gives you a little bit of guide, guidance in terms of where to begin your investigation. Um, we're going to go ahead and start with the timeline and the reason for that is because again we do have some idea of how this started and so what we want to do, we want to start at that point and then we want to see what happened in relation to that particular event. Uh, when we jump into timeline, Notice that all the data is, is listed here along the left-hand side to make it easy to jump into different data points, and we'll go into a couple of those in just a moment. Uh, but when we go into timeline, uh, there's actually a, a number of things that we can configure to show in timeline. I have right now everything, uh, but we can tighten this display up in many different ways. So we can, if there are certain things of interest that we're looking for, we can zero in on that, and then we can add things. So there is actually... Uh, a deselect all, uh, and essentially that zeroes out the display, uh, and we can add things like creation time, uh, and then just start adding uh, different pieces of data in here uh, in order to work down to where we want to be. Uh, and, and it's a good way to kind of zero in, because this can be very voluminous. I and mean, if you notice down here at the bottom, there's 265,000 entries in this timeline. Um, that, that's, that's a lot. So uh, we also have the ability to search and drill uh, through this timeline, and that's where we're going to start. So we know that rainbow unicorns, yes, there's a question in the back. Can, search and drill be done separate? can you use regex for the search? Yes, you can, actually. I'm not much of a regex guy, so I'm not going to try and freeform regex up here. But um, uh, yes, you can. Um, good question. So we know that Rainbow Unicorns is where this started. So I'm going to go ahead and do a drill. Uh, and notice that we went from 265-odd thousand items down to 12. Uh, and we can see here, uh, this basically shows the, the list and, and the download history. And we can see that this file got downloaded, this uh, unicorn-game.exe. Uh, and that's really where we're going to start, because this is where... Uh, the, the user had noticed that uh, things had gotten squirrely on her system. So I just did a right click there and I can go in and I can create a time wrinkle. There's two different things that we can use again to, to kind of clean up the display and zero in on what, what it is we want to look at. A time wrinkle will give us the ability to only show events in relation to the highlighted events, plus and minus. So by default that's five minutes, that can be changed and I'll show you that in just a minute. Time crunch is the exact opposite. So time crunch says that for one minute before and after this particular event, I want to remove every event of this type. So if you've got a lot of extraneous noise, it's a quick way to, to eliminate it out of the display. So I'm going to go ahead and, and create a time wrinkle. Uh, notice that it does have the ability to edit this here. So we could, uh, I can tighten this up. It can be longer or shorter. And I'm going to remove my filter, uh, and now we're looking at the, the timeline of events um, five minutes before and five minutes after. So I'm going to search down. I find the Rainbow Unicorn uh, website load here, 
and we can go ahead and tab down a little bit and immediately you can see uh, some interesting things that come up right after this is this this website is loaded and this in particular uh, it, there is a file that's been created here uh, in underneath the Windows system 32 uh, by our hapless user and uh, just for brevity, I'm going to go ahead and go to some some um, salient points, but uh, it is it is also a uh, alternate data stream. So this is a hidden file uh, that was created by that user, but it gives me information about it in terms of the different the, the hash, uh, where it was located. Uh, if we go down just a little bit further, we can see. More file activity. I apologize, this is not going as quickly as it should. Um, so we can see a prefetch for this. What the prefetch means is that it was queued to run, and this binary was actually executed. And this is going to give us a little bit more information on here. We can see that it was executed once. Uh, and then immediately after that was executed, again, we have more activity. Um, we can see a command.exe. This is actually the command that ran when she clicked in her browser. You can see this. I'm trying to highlight this, and I apologize. It just doesn't seem to want to work. Um, so this was the command that actually launched that. And then immediately following that, we can see different... Uh, apologize. My mouse just went nuts. Uh, we can see different things happening here. We can see that this file was changed. This is that alternate data stream. And we now see that this is actually being launched. <coughs> so this, this, product, this process has been launched. Interestingly enough, it also launches Notepad along with it. Uh, and I came to find out after doing a little bit of research that that's actually fairly significant. But... Um, so we now know that this, this file was launched. We know that there was something that was embedded in the Windows file system. So people, who, whatever this thing is, is attempting to cover its tracks. It's, a, it's an invisible file. You cannot see it from uh, um, the standard Windows interface. Uh, and it's launched that file. Uh, we can see some other activity, quite a bit of activity. And I'm going to just go ahead and move forward here a little bit just to point out some things for brevity. But we can see now uh, additional activity that's very suspicious. So you can see 7-zip, for instance. The 7-zip uh, archive utility is being written to a, a very odd location. Yes, what's the question? Mm -hmm. That came from the collector that we built. So at the beginning, when we, when we built a collector, uh, we actually ran that on the system. And then that collector creates uh, a subdirectory that has all this information and I apologize I probably should have mentioned that that's correct so so when we um, when we first start up redline uh, this is where we were talking about the creating that standard collector right and notice that it says save your collector to and you can browse that uh, and you can save that to a particular directory a USB port or, or what have you, uh, so you can execute that off of um, off the USB. I apologize if I wasn't as clear on that. Yes? What? Ah, okay, yes, I apologize. Okay. And I don't know why it's not. Um. And I actually have, so unfortunately, because of the way this operates, um, I can't actually, You know, I never used the magnifier, so. Ease of access. Ah, oh, there we go. And 
something that's not executed. appears to be washed up. Okay, okay well. Uh, I'm sorry, that's that's just not, not working. I apologize. So yeah, that is that is something of an eye chart, isn't it? Um I'll, I'll get to a couple of other uh, more interesting fields here. That what I wanted to point out is that, so, oh, there we go. Wait a minute. Uh, okay. All righty then. All right. So. Bear with me. Okay. Okay, I, again, I apologize. I'll get to some other screens that have a little bit more information, a little more uh, cool information on that. So, so we saw the download, we saw the, the, the file get created, we saw the, uh, the, the dropper get become activated. Some of the things that, that we can do from a standpoint of um, uh, being able to look at some interesting data, if we go into the processes, uh, we can see a list of processes. We see this particular process, uh, this one is the dropper process, uh, but what I wanted to point out from a standpoint of being able to see the, um, uh, the lateral movement and the, the types of things that we see with an advanced threat, if we go into the running the csrss.exe and we look at the strings in that, um, we can actually do some searches for commonly used commands. Uh, and this is actually what this is, uh, this process, this is one of those processes that I mentioned that the uh, artifacts, when they get lost, if you power the system down, uh, you're going to lose a lot of really good data. And I hope you can see that. It's probably not as, as close or as easy to read as it could be. Uh, but um, So you can see there in the center of the screen, um, had this system been powered off, had the system been rebooted, we would have lost this information. But we can actually see net use command. We can see that this, uh, this individual has not only spawned a command shell, but they are actually moving later laterally through the environment. Uh, they've, they've mounted another system. Uh, we've got at least one uh, credential set that has been compromised. Uh, and so you can see there uh, towards the bottom here that, uh, that they're running the PS exec command. So they're attempting to then execute laterally on another system. So we now have another system. We, we know at least one system has been compromised. We now have another system that we need to look at. So in this situation, this is, this is enough confirmation actually to understand that this isn't just standard garbage nonsense malware. Uh, that in fact that there, there is something more here, and we need to, um, you know, mount a uh, uh, mount an incident response. If we actually go to that system, um, I have Process Explorer running uh, to be able to see, you know, what what this system, what we can see on here, and um, this is that that process, the MSD. CSC process. Note, notice that it's listed as a remote service process. 
Notice that it is a Microsoft process. It says it's a Microsoft, but there's no signature present. Um, and in terms of the, the virus total, it's unknown. And that's, that's very typical of the sort of things that we see with targeted attackers. Um, you know, Process Explorer, for those who haven't really used it very much, uh, we do have the ability to do a verify uh, image signatures, which is what populates this field here. Uh, and we also have the ability to do virus total, to check with virus total. So it will actually just send the hash, as had been mentioned. It's not going to send the file. There is actually an option here, and this is what I had mentioned. Okay. Uh, the, this is why I mentioned as far as the, the option of being able to submit that executable. I do not recommend that. Um, apologize if I'm jumping around here, but I did want to show one more tool here, PE Studio. PE Studio is, again, it's a, it's a free tool, um, and he has quite a few indicators that are preloaded with the tool, and it's just a matter literally of dragging and dropping. Now, this is our dropper. I have a copy of it from the system, the uh, unicorn game. And we can see right away the indicators show it's a fake Microsoft executable. I mean, that right there would be enough to understand that this is something bad. Um, but it also walks through and it gives us some other things as well. It tells us that there are a number of blacklisted strings, um, that uh, there are a number of blacklisted functions. Uh, again, we have the ability using this tool, it will go ahead and try to find any results that it can find on VirusTotal. In this particular case, there aren't any because this has not been submitted up to VirusTotal. Uh, but it gives us the ability, you know, very quickly with that indicators. This is typically what I've used this for. It's just a quick snapshot, a quick glance at this binary to determine is this something that is questionable? If so, what are the questionable aspects of that? Uh, and, and, you know, again, it's not intended to be um, a deep dive on, on every aspect of, of the binary, but uh, it gives you that quick ability to triage and determine whether or not you're dealing with something that is commodity or whether this is something that's targeted. Are there any questions, anything that, that, that we haven't gone over? Yes, sir. So most of the time we get hard drives that are off, like I just get a, a cold machine or whatever, mm -hmm. and Nice. I was wondering if Redline would do something like that, so then I can be like, this guy's missing like three of the Internet Explorer patches, and so I, I should focus on things that are, that are related to Internet Explorer. Well, it's a great question. Right, so, so we do have a patch level that's, that's listed for this, and that you... Has to have a machine on there, right? Yes, it does, yeah. That so it's not going to work, yeah, unfortunately, it. yeah. And, and, we, and we can enumerate the registry as well. So, you know, there's certain things like we can enumerate the registry and you can search and pivot and drill through that. But you're right, it, it does require the system to be up and active and to run the, run the collector in order to do that. Yes, yeah. Yep, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for attending. Yep. Understood.